Good evening, I'm Gotti Schwartz. Welcome back to another edition of Now Tonight. Here's just some of the stories we're working on this hour. A court rules on the fate of Title 42. That's the controversial pandemic health policy that is at the very center of a growing humanitarian crisis on the U.S. border. We're going to show you what's happening right now on the ground in Mexico and in the U.S. Uh, some 800 um, you know, migrants and, and asylum seekers have come to Denver, and that has overwhelmed us. Then silenced on Twitter, the uproar over Elon Musk's suspension of journalists and what could come next. Ducks, you get suspended, end of story, that's it. And confiscated at the airport. How many guns do you think were seized at U.S. airports this year? A couple hundred? Try thousands. Most passengers tell us when we discover their, their firearm in the carry-on bag that they forgot it was there. Um, I, think, I think that all by itself is a problem. Plus a language for every list. Meet the Santa Claus that speaks American Sign Language. I asked Santa Claus if I could get a dirt bike and I want a black one. And we start with breaking news. Several outlets are now reporting that a federal court in D.C. has denied a request by more than a dozen states to keep Title 42 in place. That's the policy uh, that's been used more than two million times to turn migrants away from the border. With this ruling, Title 42 will end next Wednesday, December 21st. The 19 Republican-led states hoping to delay the end of Title 42 previously said they would ask the Supreme Court to intervene if the D.C.-based based appeals court denied their request. Meanwhile, down at the border, crowds line the banks of the Rio Grande River. There they are, right? Uh, you're looking at them on the screen. They are waiting in Juarez, Mexico, to cross into El Paso, Texas. Border agents say around 2,500 migrants are crossing every single day. Officials tell NBC News that number could double if Title 42 is lifted, while communities across the Southwest are getting ready for tens of thousands of asylum seekers. Shelters in Phoenix, Dallas, and Houston are preparing for migrants being bussed in from El Paso. The mayor of Denver declaring a public emergency yesterday. He says the city is on the verge of a breaking point. What does Denver need from the federal government? Well, first of all, we need the federal government, Congress in particular, to act and work with the president to come up with a immigration, immigration policy. All this preceded the pandemic, and it has certainly preceded Title 42. We need action as quickly as possible in immigration uh, policy. Once again, the cities are bearing the brunt of a lack of activity at the federal level to address the serious issue at our borders. Now, the politics on this are one thing, and we're going to get to that in just a moment, but this is also a humanitarian crisis. And to see that firsthand, take a listen to the conditions our colleagues at Telemundo have found these migrants are facing every day. Esta es la realidad. El padre de la Iglesia Sagrado Corazón en El Paso les dice a una veintena de inmigrantes que ya no hay lugar y tuvieron que pasar la noche al intemperie en la calle. Coger un puente donde dormir, debajo de un puente, porque ¿dónde más? Aquí el frío es muy bravo. Esperar aquí en la calle es un poco complicado por el frío. No, no, pues Demasiado frío, frío y aparte la gente, ¿para qué se ha pegado de nosotros? No. El aeropuerto del Paso también está lleno de inmigrantes durmiendo en el suelo. Hay algunos concejales del Paso que están en contra de esta triste realidad. Aseguran que los migrantes se están congelando y merecen un trato mejor. También exigen se declare el estado de emergencia para tener... Más ayuda. And we're going to have a little bit more on this developing story later this hour. Meanwhile, a huge storm system is bringing all kinds of chaos to nearly every corner of the United States. In the Northeast, nearly 9 million people are now under a winter weather alert from Pennsylvania to Maine. Parts of upstate New York could see two feet of snow this weekend. In the Upper Plains, this is a fourth straight date of blizzard warnings, and the snow is still falling out there. And in the South, at least 50 tornadoes have touched down in seven states this week, killing three people. We're going to check in with NBC's meteorologist Bill Karens with the latest. Bill, uh, what's the uh, forecast looking like this weekend? It's looking like we can finally take a, you know, a deep breath and try to recover from this before we have to deal with our next event next week. So uh, the storm is still with us. I mean, northern New England, it's still snowing hard. The sun is set and it's sticking back on some of the roads. So be careful anywhere driving pretty much north of Albany, Vermont, New Hampshire and Maine, areas that can deal with this this time of year. But still, it's going to be significant if you're traveling through the overnight hours. And as we said, we still have winter storm warnings for a good chunk here 
here of northern New England. Anywhere, though, from about the Mass Pike southwards, the roads are just wet, and we're going to be recovering nicely over the weekend. So additional snowfall, you have to go to the peaks of some of the mountains to get up there about a 9 to 12-inch snowfall. It's going to snow hard in Maine for a good portion of the night and the first half of tomorrow, but the rest of the region will be clearing things out nicely. So how does your weekend forecast go? The thing that will catch everyone's attention, and everyone east of the Rockies, you're going to feel it too later in not just the weekend, but into next week, is the bitter cold that's going to start coming down from Canada. The first significant surges, and there'll probably be two or three of them, with the biggest one being towards the middle of next week. But for getting errands done, everyone is good. You know, it's a big weekend to get those to-do list things checked off. There will be some lake effect snow. Watch out around the Buffalo area south and off of Lake Michigan. Uh, those are the only two real problems. By the time we get to Sunday, more of the same, just starting to track that very frigid air. So let's talk about this Arctic blast. Right now, it's cold. This is kind of regular cold. Temperatures in the teens, wind chilled in the single digits. But we're going to go to even northern plains type cold by the time we get to the morning. Bismarck, negative 20 wind chills. Rapid City, negative 3. It's starting to get pretty cold in Omaha through Iowa, heading towards Chicago. And then next week, that big surge of cold air comes down Tuesday into Wednesday. Minneapolis, this isn't wind chill. This is your actual temperature, negative 1 Tuesday morning. Chicago is going to be in the teens. Your coldest mornings will be Wednesday into Thursday. And all of this cold was going to move all the way through to the southeast. So here's the forecast from right before Christmas, the 22nd, all the way to the 26th. Much below colder uh, and then average everywhere east of Denver, where the west coast actually is going to be enjoying some very warm December uh, weather. So we have the cold. So now the question is, is it going to be stormy? It's going to be cold enough for snow in a lot of places. Our European computer model takes our next big storm. This would be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday into the Great Lakes. That would be a significant snowstorm for the Midwest, possibly for areas around the Great Lakes like Chicago. But our American model is completely different. It's about 600 miles away from the other one. Takes this storm to the east coast and up the eastern seaboard with a big snowstorm for a lot of the east coast. So unfortunately, we don't have a lot of answers yet with who's going to get the worst of that storm. Right now, we're just thinking above average precip and cold in the northeast and the Great Lakes. So, Gotti, we know for sure we're going to have a really big storm right before Christmas. We just can't tell you yet who's going to get it. So I know a lot of people, some people want the white Christmas. Some people are nervous about their travel. Um, but we just don't have the details yet. I think by about Monday and Tuesday, we'll pin that down for you. Bill, crazy to see those two models so so different there. <laughs> yeah, that's far apart. 600 mile spread is, is big, but it's still seven days away. So that gap will close in the next couple days. Bill, thanks so much. And turning now to some medical news tonight, several pediatric hospitals around the country are seeing increases in group A strep infections. That's a severe sickness that happens when bacteria moves to areas of your bodies that are normally germ-free, like the bloodstream. In the Denver area, they usually see only one or two invasive cases like this a month. But this year, two kids have already died, and 11 others have been diagnosed since November 1st. Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, which is the largest pediatric hospital in the U.S., reported 60 probable cases of strep A in October and November. That's about four times higher than normal. Hospitals in Arizona and Washington are also reporting increases. But we're not just seeing this happen here in the United States. In the U.K., at least 15 kids have died from Strep A since September. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel. Uh, Dr. Patel, how is Strep A different from regular strep throat? Yeah, Getty, it's a great question. Anybody who has strep throat, diagnosed strep throat, has an infection with group A streptococcus, the type of bacteria you mentioned. So group A strep can cause other things, and it's exactly what you mentioned, besides strep throat. But most of us commonly get strep throat, only a very rare, but unfortunately, a number of people across the world are experiencing this, especially infants, that are getting these invasive group A strep infections. And we have to be vigilant, especially parents, to look for unusual rashes and any other unusual signs or symptoms of sickness and children to the doctor right away. And Dr. Patel, we're also seeing this surge in RSV cases that we've been reporting on among kids as well. Uh, you can also see this graph right here. Hospitalizations for kids under four have skyrocketed since October. We've got COVID. We've got flu. Uh, is all of this driving a rise in strep A cases? Yeah, it's a really important question because it does feel like everywhere you turn, there is just more viral illness or bacterial illness like group A strep. Here's the important pattern that we have to recognize. 
most of these really serious like group A strep infections or bacterial pneumonias or other infections that require antibiotics actually start with a viral presentation, a viral illness like a common cold, like an RSV infection or the flu, which is why we are trying so hard to prevent those infections from happening because those infections set up even a very healthy child or older adult to get these more intensive and really debilitating bacterial infections. Now, if you can get diagnosed quickly and you can take care of yourself, that's great. But unfortunately, once these infections hit, it's called invasive for a reason. It can be a matter of hours before they really savage the body. Hey, doctor, turning real quick to COVID, hospitals are preparing for this winter surge in cases as we head into the holidays. For a lot of people, holidays are just lots of kissing, uh, lots of hugs from grandma and yeah. grandpa, big family gatherings. For people with little kids, uh, are there any extra precautions they should take? Yeah, so I, I can't, I've got little kids, and so I'm doing exactly what I preach because this is what I tell my patients with little children or anybody in their family. I, number one, I'm going to test with a rapid antigen test. There are now government tests that are available, covidtest.gov, so you can get some free ones for your household. I'm going to do that before I get on a plane, train, or metro, and I'm going to make sure that myself and my children, if they're over the age of two, are comfortably masked with a high-quality mask when we're crowded in spaces. Think of Think of your mask like you do an umbrella. If you're in a place that's really raining, you're going to pull out that umbrella, just like a mask. And then the second thing, Gaddy, is that when you're with those family members, hugging and kissing, if they haven't been able to test, then you can encourage them to test if you have it. If not, at a minimum, avoid sharing utensils, avoid sharing food products. That could be hard in the holidays. We all want to taste each other's pies and, and treats. But try to avoid it and try to wash hands frequently or use that sanitizer. Those elements together can actually keep you pretty healthy and safe. And Dr. Patel, you're, you're a doctor and you're a mom. Any quick pointers on how to keep a mask on a little one? Asking for oh, a friend, I, uh, obviously. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, asking, asking for a friend. I'm going to ask right. for my own friend. Don't let, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. I've got a four-year-old where she just cannot put the KN95 I can put on my six-year-old. So I use a <laughs> surgical mask and I try to twist the ear ties just to make sure. And I, and I just keep a bit of humility and grace that she's at least trying. And that's the most important thing, along with keeping her updated on her vaccine. And that means flu, Perfect. chicken pox, anything. Those are the best combinations, Gaddy, but a lot Dr. of grace. Dr. Patel, <laughs> got it. Thank you so very much. Thank Part you. of the White House's preparation for the winter COVID cases are getting uh, tests to as many people as they possibly can. Uh, they've put a website up where you can go. It's covidtest.gov, and you get up to four of those tests per household. Again, covidtest.gov. And now let's head over to China, where COVID is spreading like wildfire. The country's own experts figure more than 840 million people could be affected within a few months. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer has more. Across China, COVID is spreading like wildfire. The country's own experts figuring more than 840 million people could be affected within a few months. The Omicron variant spreading so rapidly here that officials in Beijing simply stopped counting asymptomatic cases. It's unclear how many here are already infected, but all week the city has been a ghost town. People either too sick or too afraid to venture out. The few lineups around at government fever clinics or at pharmacies, the ones we saw struggling to meet demand for testing kits and medication like ibuprofen. For the longest time, people weren't able to buy over-the-counter medications, so now there's a rush to stock up. The concern that the health care system won't be able to cope with the crisis. Already, health officials have told medics to report to work even if they have COVID. The death toll is expected to rise, though official numbers here remain vague. While the surge across China started when zero COVID measures were lifted, it's likely infections were already spreading fast. Experts say it could now be doubling every day. There's no pre-existing immunity from prior waves of COVID because there haven't been prior waves of COVID in China. That's different to other parts of the world. And so the only immunity is from vaccination and that doesn't do much to stop infection. COVID is hitting China like never before. Just weeks ago, harsh zero tolerance rules would have meant centralized quarantine and lockdowns. Now health officials are urging people with mild symptoms to avoid going to hospitals or even calling medical hotlines. Uh, 
To be honest, I was scared to get the virus, says Shin Mei, adding she's good with it now because building immunity means she can visit relatives without worrying. There's been a whiplash change in state media messaging around COVID-2. No longer demonized, Omicron is among the hottest topics on social media. And top officials are playing down its severity, even renaming it the coronavirus cold. But there is a looming worry that the sheer scope of infections in China will allow the virus to mutate and form new COVID variants that could impact the rest of the world. Janice Mackey for your NBC News, Beijing. And updating that breaking news we brought you at the top of the show, a federal court in D.C. has denied a request to keep Title 42 in place. That's that policy that allowed migrants to be turned away from the border. Unless the Supreme Court intervenes, Title 42 will end on Wednesday. Here to talk about this is Lauren Villagran. She's a border reporter at the El Paso Times. Uh, Lauren, thank you so very much for joining us on this Friday night. Uh, what does this ruling say? This is the ruling that um, that has. Uh, could you tell me again the the ruling that just came out? Yeah, the ruling that just came out specifically. Does this this basically says Title Forty Two is over next Wednesday? Is that correct? That's correct. So what we know is that the Biden administration had been fighting this order for some time. Uh, it now is required to be terminated next Wednesday, and. Um, and yeah, we have seen hundreds of migrants lining up at the border. Um, we've seen hundreds of migrants lining up at the border overnight in freezing temperatures. The Border Patrol is processing something like 2,500 people per day. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a humanitarian crisis that the city and county of El Paso have been dealing with. Now, just looking down the road here, I mean, you're in El Paso. El Paso and Juarez are so close. Uh, how do you think this news is going to be met by those who are in Central America right now, those who may be transiting through Mexico? They're saying it could double by next week, but you're, you're down there in the borderlands. What do you think is going to happen if and when this is lifted? So... I spoke with DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas earlier this week, and he made clear that the U.S. government is working very closely with the Mexican government right now. I would expect some kind of arrangement or agreement in the coming days uh, to either stem the flow of people to the southwest border um, or perhaps another type of program like we saw with the Venezuelans and the Ukrainians that traded additional work visas for um, a different legal pathway for processing uh -huh. Venezuelans. Um, you know, it is it is a day-by-day -day situation here. Uh, the federal government has promised additional resources to the city of El Paso and the county of El Paso, which is providing shelter, as you can see from these pictures here. Uh -huh. And... Um, and, and yeah, I mean, as you can see, that's the Rio Grande right there. Ciudad Juarez is on the south side, El Paso on the north side. The two cities are sewn together at the seam. And, uh, you know, the number of people who have been coming to the U.S. border to seek asylum um, could increase substantially in the coming days. Do you think that, do you think that El Paso is prepared for what's to come. It would seem as though this is not coming as a surprise. We've known that there uh, is a, an end date associated with Title 42 for quite some time. There has been a lot of time for preparation, but it would also seem as though uh, right now you've got uh, you, all of the shelters are full. Uh, people are being bussed out of El Paso. Is El Paso prepared for next week? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question to answer because we don't know exactly what the need is going to be. I mean, I can tell you that every new demographic, every new group of people that comes to the U.S. border seeking asylum or other relief is treated as a crisis by the federal government. And uh, without comprehensive immigration reform mm -hmm. as Secretary Mayorkas has talked about as Republican uh, Congressman Tony Gonzalez and Democrat Congresswoman Veronica Escobar have talked about, 
uh, without some kind of dramatic change, we're going to treat every new group that arrives at the border as a crisis. And it falls on border cities to uh, provide that welcome um, to the extent possible. But, you know, with the number of people that we're seeing, I can tell you that I met with migrants this morning um, who had spent the night on the street because there just isn't enough room for everyone in the shelters uh, with the way that that the, that the crisis is being approached right now. Um, Congresswoman Escobar has asked the federal government to stand up emergency shelters. We know the federal government is capable of this. Uh, they did so with the Afghan refugees at the Fort Bliss military base, and within days had an operating refugee shelter um, that temporarily housed 10,000 people. So, um, you know, I think folks here, border residents, are, are waiting for some answers from the federal government. And, you know, at the same time, coyotes, smugglers in Mexico are telling all sorts of lies. Mm -hmm. I've heard migrants tell me that the border is closing on the 21st. I've heard others saying, oh, the door is going to open on the 21st. So there's an awful lot of confusion. And I can see so many of those groups and coyotes now taking this news and using it as a way to to, to sell something down the road. Uh, Lauren, I can't thank you enough. I mean, so often we hear crisis, we don't hear immigration reform and comprehensive immigration reform. That's a context that's missing in this story so often. So thank you. Thank you. And after the break, we're talking all things Twitter. The accounts of some pretty high-profile journalists have been suspended. Why Elon Musk says he took action. And janitors who lost their positions at Twitter's San Francisco headquarters are fighting to get their jobs back. We're just getting started on Now Tonight. Elon Musk is facing a lot of backlash tonight after Twitter suspended the accounts of several high-profile journalists. The accounts of Ryan Mack of The New York Times, Donnie O'Sullivan of CNN, Drew Har Harwell of The Washington Post are just some of those suspended. And Musk says he suspended these accounts because they shared, quote, my exact real-time location, basically assassination coordinates in obvious direct violation of Twitter terms and of service. He also dropped in on a Twitter space chat with a bunch of journalists discussing all this hours after that move. Here's just a part of that exchange with one of the journalists facing a ban. I never posted your address. You posted a link to the address. We posted a link. We, in, in the course of reporting about Elon Jet, we posted links to Elon Jet, which are now not online. Your docs, you get suspended, end of story, that's it. Now, we want to be clear, NBC News has not been able to verify these allegations, but Musk uh, has since posted a poll on his account titled, Unsuspend Accounts Who Doxed My Exact Location in Real Time. There's still two hours remaining in that poll, and as of now, nearly 60 percent have voted that the accounts should be reinstated now. NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward joins me now. Jake, uh, just yesterday we were waiting for the tweet storm to happen. Then it happened. Uh, can you bring us up to speed? Uh, why is Elon Musk saying these journalists doxed him? And where does Elon Jet fit into all this? Well, Elon Jed is probably the right place to start here, Gotti. It's, you know, a, a, an account started by a college student, Jack Sweeney, who, weirdly enough, is a fan of Elon Musk. His idea was that he wanted to use publicly available air traffic control records to follow Elon Musk's jet around, basically know its coordinates as it moves from place to place because he wanted to know where the billionaire was going and try and keep up with his de business dealings in that way. Now, whether you feel that that is an appropriate way uh, to be using Twitter, the weird thing is this is is actually an account that Elon Musk had defended in describing his own position on free speech. He said he was a free speech absolutist and that even that account was going to be protected under his leadership of Twitter. Well, now we know that is no longer the case. He complained openly about this account. He then uh, blamed it for uh, what he says was a stalker that allegedly uh, tried to intercept a car with his kid in it. And then as a series of uh, journalists began to report on this, including 
including me and other everyone else who is on this beat. He chose a select few of the most high-profile ones on Twitter, not coincidentally the people with the biggest Twitter followings, and those people got suspended, even though, as you say, we haven't been able to see any evidence that they, in fact, revealed his location. All they did was occasionally link to the Elon Jet account. So what we're seeing here is a very large reaction and something really unimaginable up until this point in Twitter's history, Gotti. I'm literally looking up your Twitter right now just to see if you're still instated. Uh, do we know I'm how long on. these... Yeah, I'm still on. I don't, still on. I don't make the cut. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. hmm. I'm still up. That's right. Uh, it, do we know how long these suspensions are going to last? Is it seven days? Is it permanently? Is there a chance that he... I don't know how the buttons work at Twitter, but is there a chance that this could all go away in, like, the next half an hour? Well, this is the thing, right? We really have no idea. I've just been hitting refresh time and again to make sure uh, that the, our information is still accurate. As of this hour, <laughs> Donnie O'Sullivan, Drew Harwell, uh, and and uh, Brian Mack are all still suspended. Um, that uh, 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 survey, that poll that you described that he put up um, still stands there, and people are mostly voting for the idea that he should be putting them back uh, in right now. Um, but we have no idea, right? There is no official policy established by this. And the real bigger problem here... Uh, Gotti, of course, you know, in addition to all of the First Amendment worries that one might have about this, is that journalists now, of course, are going out of their way to find all of the instances in which other people have had their real-time location revealed. Other people, uh, and in, in some cases, uh, there are instances in which Elon Musk then responded to it. Farhad Banju, one of the columnists of the New York Times, actually pointed out an instance in which Fox News had been following migrants at the border with a drone in real time and then pointed out that underneath Elon Musk wrote a response. Wow. So we're seeing time and again that this is not really a policy as much as it seems to be his personal reaction to a situation that affected him directly, Gandhi. Jake, thanks so much for watching it for us. And the Twitter saga doesn't end here. Janitors who were abruptly fired from Twitter's San Francisco headquarters are now demanding their jobs back. The group joined other former workers in a picket line outside the company's headquarters. The janitor's union president says that 48 families have been put out of work just three weeks before Christmas. From our NBC Bay Area affiliate, Sergio Quintana has a story. On the steps of San Francisco City Hall, some of the Twitter cleaning crew workers that have now been locked out of the building for weeks announced two legal actions. They're filing claims with the National Labor Relations Board against a new cleaning crew contractor at Twitter, and they're filing lawsuits in state court claiming Twitter violated state and local laws by abruptly ending its written agreement with their old contractor. In the city and county of San Francisco, there are laws that protect workers. There are laws that they have to be bound to respect. The former cleaning crew has been picketing outside Twitter headquarters for weeks. And at today's event, city and state leaders joined in blasting Elon Musk's actions since taking over and the way he's treated the cleaning crew workers and other former employees. Elon Musk is letting Nazis back onto the platform. Did Elon Musk go to kindergarten? Because in kindergarten, we learn that we have to share with one another, to treat one another with respect. Among those at this event, San Francisco Mayor London Breed. Elon Musk has already criticized the mayor after city building inspectors were sent to Twitter headquarters because of complaints that he set up sleeping quarters in the building. Mayor London Breed and other city leaders have tough talk for the way that Twitter is treating its former employees. But the mayor is also careful to say she's willing to work with Elon Musk. To try and p appeal to the empathetic side of this company that has enjoyed significant tax breaks at the beginning of their inception when they decided to go to mid-market. This all comes amid new reports from the New York Times claiming Twitter has not been paying rent on its properties, including the San Francisco headquarters, and a new listing on bidspotter.com that appears to show everything from Twitter's office furniture to its neon logos are now up for auction. City leaders say they want Twitter to be a better employer, but they don't want the company to leave. I mean, listen, any company that leaves San Francisco, we're not happy here in San Francisco. We want to ensure that we're retaining because those are real jobs. In San Francisco, Sergio Quintana, NBC, Bay Area News. Sergio, thank you. After the break, some of the other headlines we're keeping an eye on tonight, including an update from WNBA star Brittany Griner, which has her fans pretty excited. Plus, an aquarium holding hundreds of tropical fish bursts in Berlin. The images are insane. 
and an exclusive report on weapons confiscated by the TSA. Some of the places people are hiding guns is unbelievable, like inside of a raw chicken. Yeah, that really happened. That's all coming up, so stay tuned. Now time for some of the headlines we're watching tonight. An American college student who went missing during a study abroad trip in France has been found alive. That's according to the family of 22-year-old Ken Deland Jr., who was first reported missing nearly three weeks ago. Deland called his family from Spain early this morning, but the details surrounding his disappearance are still unclear. Brittany Griner taking to Instagram today to share her gratitude, writing, it feels so good to be home. The basketball star also thanked President Biden, the medical staff in Texas who cared for her, and confirmed she intends to play in the upcoming WNBA season. The post was her first since being freed from Russia after 10 months in custody. A QAnon believer who chased a U.S. Capitol Police officer on January 6th was just sentenced to five years in prison. Doug Jensen was found guilty on seven counts, including federal charges of civil disorder and assaulting, resisting, or impeding officers. He was one of the first 10 rioters to enter the Capitol on that day. And the Senate has averted a partial government shutdown that was scheduled to begin tomorrow. They voted to pass a one-week extension of federal government funding, and that gives lawmakers an additional week to negotiate and pass a comprehensive bill to fund federal agencies throughout the fiscal year. And while much of the country may be battling winter storms, right now here in SoCal, we are actually in an extreme drought. The Metro Water District declaring a drought emergency for all of Southern California. Now for context, this is the nation's largest water supplier. If conditions don't improve by next April, mandatory water restrictions could become a reality for about 19 million people. With the holiday travel rush approaching, alarming new numbers are coming in from TSA. The agency says it's confiscated a record number of guns this year at airport checks, and most of them were loaded. In an NBC News exclusive, Tom Costello talks to the TSA administrator about just how common guns are becoming the, into the U.S. and some wild places people are hiding them. The collection of weapons discovered at U.S. airports is stunning. Lots of guns hidden in a PlayStation, stuffed inside a raw chicken, bags and boxes of ammo. So far this year, 6,300 guns confiscated at TSA checkpoints, a record. On track to surpass 6,600 by year's end, 10% more than last year. And nearly all were loaded. TSA Chief David Pekoski at the agency's training center in Virginia. Why does this keep happening? Well, I think the, you know, people carrying guns is much more prevalent in the United States. Most passengers tell us when we discover their, their firearm in the carry-on bag that they forgot it was there. Um, I, think, I think that all by itself is a problem, um, but clearly you cannot bring a firearm into a checkpoint. You cannot bring a firearm uh, onto an aircraft. The airports with the most gun confiscations, Atlanta, DFW, Houston Intercontinental, Nashville with the highest per passenger ratio, and Phoenix. The TSA screens nearly five and a half million bags every single day at 430 airports nationwide. The challenge is the same at every one, detecting every possible explosive, every knife, every gun. The TSA showed us what a gun looks like when it goes through the CT scanner. We keep it in the scanner because, you know, we don't want anyone or the person that does have it, if they do have ill intent, to grab it um, and use it in a public area. While police prosecute according to local gun laws, the TSA is now raising the federal fine up to $15,000 for bringing a gun to a checkpoint. If you're a pre-check passenger, uh, we will also revoke your pre-check privileges uh, for a period of time. As the country's proliferation of guns spreads to airports, too. Tom Costello, NBC News, Arlington, Virginia. Passengers can legally check a gun as luggage if it's declared, unloaded, and packed inside a locked and approved hard shell case. The TSA's website has instructions on the proper steps you need to follow if you want to do that. Gotti? Tom, thank you. Now let's head to Jackson, Mississippi, where a water crisis left thousands without access to safe drinking water. It's a subject of a new NBC News digital documentary special, Boiling Point, A City's Fight for Clean Water. NBC's Zinkley Asamoah has a preview. 
Jackson, Mississippi is grappling with an ongoing water crisis. In August, flooding knocked out an aging water treatment plant, but the problems with Jackson's water system did not start then. They are decades in the making. We have a new documentary film putting a spotlight on residents and asking critical questions to Jackson's leadership. Waiting in the water, children, waiting in the water, children, waiting in the water, children, waiting in the water. Water is not a want, water is a need. My everyday life is based around water. Each and every day, that's a need. And I need it now. Tonight, the state of emergency declared in Mississippi nearly 200,000 people cut off from clean water. This is our life. See what we've been dealing with all our lives here. The crisis after heavy rain and flooding from the Pearl River. Flooding that the mayor says overwhelmed the main water treatment plant. This ain't nothing that happened overnight, three days ago, eight weeks ago, or back in March or September or August. It's still going on right now. The water is not safe to drink, and I would even say it's not safe to brush your teeth with. We still use a bottle of water, still have to boil water, still have to get out and go fetch water each and every day. I'm not putting this poison back in my kids because this is unclean water. I sat down with Jackson's mayor asking about the effects of lead on children and pregnant women in the city. We also talked to the president and CEO of the NAACP, Derek Johnson, who filed a lawsuit against city and state leadership, and Congressman Benny Thompson, who represents Mississippians. What does water mean to you? Sick. All this comes as just weeks ago, the U.S. Department of Justice filed a new lawsuit against Jackson, alleging the city mismanaged the water system. There's so much to uncover, and we hope you'll dive in with us. You can watch the full film on all NBC platforms, YouTube, Peacock, On Demand, and on NBC News Now, Friday, December 16th at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Back to you. Zinkley, looking forward to it. As Zinkley said, you can catch the full film on all NBC platforms tonight at 10.30 Eastern. We've been watching the news all day for you, and there is some stuff that has us like, whoa, you got to see this. And we're going to start with two Florida men who got lucky after they were thrown from a tumbling tanker truck. They'd lost control when they were ejected through the front windshield. That truck was carrying over 1,000 gallons of cooking oil. Neither one of them was wearing a seatbelt, but thankfully, they only had minor injuries. In Berlin, see this huge aquarium? Yeah, it completely burst. It spilled over 260,000 gallons pouring out. Uh, that was called the Aqua Dome a tourist attraction this morning. It left behind this huge flood of water, debris, hundreds of tropical fish. The company that owns the aquarium says the reason it burst is still unclear. And a Florida man caught a bear on his front porch stealing his Chick-fil-A delivery. A homeowner can be heard saying that the black bear got away with his chicken nuggets and fries, but for some reason he didn't want anything to do with his salad. And two words we didn't think we'd be saying today, monkey trading. After the break, a look at the multi-billion dollar industry and the troubling effects it has on the animals and the environment. This might be one of those stories where you're like, wait, this is actually a thing? Because to be honest, that was my first reaction when I heard about this NBC News investigation into all this. But we're about to take you very deep into the multi-billion dollar trade of monkeys that are regularly imported into the United States for medical research. Every single year, thousands of these monkeys are flown from across the world into U.S. airports where they're met by airport crews dressed in hazmat suits. Now, each one of those monkeys is worth tens of thousands of dollars. And after a month of quarantine, they're cleared to be sold for medical research. This U.S. kind of pipeline that is literally hoovering these monkeys out of the forest, we are wiping these monkeys off the face of this planet. NBC News senior investigative producer Anna Schechter joins us right now. Anna, this is something that you've been working on since March. Can you tell us a little bit about what you found? Sure, Gotti. Well, this is surprising, like you mentioned. Every year, more than 30,000 monkeys are imported into the United States. They're brought on airplanes, and increasingly, over the last few years, Cambodia has stepped in to fill this 
voracious demand from the biomedical research industry in the U.S., in part fueled by the COVID-19 pandemic. And China actually used to supply most of those 30,000 monkeys. But when COVID-19 hit, Beijing shut the door, and so Cambodia stepped in. So in 2019, Cambodia supplied like 25 percent of the 30,000 monkeys. And then two years later, that number grew to more than 60 percent of the monkeys coming into the U.S., which caused experts to realize that actually there was no way the breeding centers that are all over Cambodia, there are about six or seven massive facilities uh, that breed these monkeys, they couldn't supply that many. And so they knew that some of those were illegally getting pulled out of their natural habitat, the forest and shipped on airplanes into the U.S. And just a couple weeks ago, the Department of Justice announced a major crackdown charging eight um, in connection to an illegal smuggling ring of, of laundering of monkeys from the wild being passed off as bred in captivity for research, which can really affect wow. the research industry. And we're just watching some of the video uh, from the investigation. It looks like undercover video uh, from some of those monkeys in what looks like a forest. Can you tell us a little bit about the ecological devastation and some of the ethical breaches that you came across? Absolutely. So that footage that is really tough to watch, it's from Indonesia last year, and there's a, gr a group of poachers who were literally pulling them out of trees and stuffing them into bags and then putting them into bamboo crates. Um, and then those we know were actually shipped into the lab testing industry, the international industry. And so the fact that we were able to work with a group called Action for primates to obtain this video. The group obtained this video, and that was really the proof. And it just reveals the tactics that are used by poachers. It's really violent. There are babies that are separated from mothers um, almost right after birth uh, because the mothers are the ones that are really needed for the breeding. Uh, so it was, it was a fascinating um, foray into this world that I had known very little about until I started diving in. And we also worked, you heard Lisa Jones Engel there speaking. She is a former primatologist. She worked for 20 years in the field and in classrooms at the University of Washington. And just a few years ago, she re resigned once she realized all the testing that was going on at other organizations, other researchers, and she just felt that the trade had to stop. And she she decided to join PETA, and um, which was a bold move. And, and just kind of going through some of this investigation, I don't even know if I'm reading this right. I, I know it looks like two different types of primates monkeys are, are used in these types of testings, and uh, one of them might be endangered. Is that is that right? That's exactly right, and it is in part because of this international trade that feeds the pharmaceutical industry. So the long-tailed macaques is a specific kind of monkey, and they make up 99% of the 30,000-some-odd monkeys that are brought in annually to the United States. And they are now endangered. Just over the summer, they were. it was announced that they were endangered. And one other species called the pig-tailed macaque is also endangered, and that is widely used around the U.S. in uh, laboratory testing. Both of them endangered. That is absolutely unbelievable. Anna, thank you so very much. Thanks for having me. And while so many of us here get to spend the holidays with loved ones, not everyone is that lucky. So to keep those serving our country in mind, our Molly Hunter headed out to visit the troops ahead of the holiday to see how they're doing. For some people, the holidays can be hard, especially if you're far away from home. And the men and women serving in the United States military know that all too well. Molly Hunter went aboard the USS George H.W. Bush to see how our Navy service members are doing this holiday season. Take a look. Just off the port of Naples, Italy, we joined about 5,000 American sailors on board the massive aircraft carrier USS George H.W. Bush. <laughs> Average age, 22. More than 75% are on their first deployment. And for many, that means first time away for the holidays. 
Command Master Chief Stephanie Canteen from the Bronx, mother of four, has been in the Navy 27 years, and this isn't her first Christmas aboard. We have family here, and we can make uh, the family here our family away from home. Uh, it's going to be hard, but while we're here, make the best of this yeah. time right here, because yeah. we're family as well. What happens here on Christmas? I love it here on, on Christmas, because this time uh, they put on a big feast, a big meal. Everybody comes together. Melanie Seymour has also done this before. Her husband, also in the Navy, currently at home with their three kids. I just have to remind them that, that you know, it's, it's temporary yeah. um, and I will be home soon. And Devante Randolph will be missing his two daughters this Christmas, Kalia and Sanaya, ages five and seven. Do they get what dad's doing right now? Uh, they know I'm out here working. They think I'm saving the animals right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are the hot shot fighter pilots. Naval aviators today flying F-18s. Here, rating landings down on the LSO platform. Combat ready always. And then it was my turn. <laughs> Shooting off the catapult, not quite at Top Gun Heights. We're in a cargo plane, but still feeling the need for speed. As part of the core mission of deterrence, the sidewinders of Strike Fighter Squadron 86 participated in NATO exercise Neptune Strike back in October. But below deck, everyone's getting in the holiday spirit. What happens here? So I see a Christmas tree. I hear lots of food happens. We have the whole month uh, dedicated to Christmas movies. <laughs> yeah, October was spooky season. Now we have Christmas season. So. Okay, what are the Christmas movies on top? Uh, like uh, the holiday, uh, Love Actually. Uh, yeah. Die Hard. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. Obviously. Oh, okay. Top Gun, great Christmas movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the mess hall, Danielle Conklin and her friends are all on their first deployment. How does your family feel about you being out here? Um, they're all so excited for me because I have a really big family and we didn't come from much, so I'm like out here, you know? <laughs> Doing it. Yeah in the world. So we, we select a few sailors every year. Setting the tone from the very top, now, you know, Rear Admiral Dennis, Dennis Velez, Puerto Rican native, father of three. He has served 31 years. And with a war going on in Europe, he says it feels different out here. One of the things that is really interesting about this, this deployment for me is that we see the Russians operating in the Mediterranean on their own. For us, it's it, it just a signal of you know how, how, how unified NATO is. And it's, how strong it is right now. It is the best that I've ever seen. The commitment, the dedication, seven to eight months away from family, is steadfast. And, from the and Master Chief Canteen says everyone here believes in their mission. From sea to shining sea. Molly Hunter, NBC News, on board USS George H.W. Bush. Molly, thank you. And finally, here's something we were thrilled to learn tonight. You want to see how to say Merry Christmas in sign language? It goes like this. This is Merry, and this is Christmas. Merry Christmas. And it's that type of simple message that's so important to one Santa in Maryland, bringing holiday cheer to kids he shares a very unique connection with. Here's NBC's Gary Grumbach with tonight's Inspiring America. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas at the Gaylord Resort in Maryland. Presents under the tree, stockings hung by the chimney with care. And these children hoping Santa Charles will soon be there. Santa Charles is a fully authorized member of Santa Claus's team. The beard, the hat, even the key to Santa's workshop. He's also a member of the deaf community. I'm so excited to be here with you all. And he's traveling across the country this holiday season, lighting up the faces of fellow deaf and hard of hearing people. Deaf child sees a deaf Santa Claus. You know, there's so much happiness. For Kavon Woodard, it's a first. I asked Santa Claus if I could get a dirt bike, and I want a black one. And Santa Claus said that I had to be a good boy, I had to listen to my mom, and hopefully I get my wish. It's an experience his mother April didn't have as a child. My mom said it was just important for me to say hi and give him a hug, and he would just give me a thumbs up, and that was it. Parents watching the joy in their children's eyes. There are so many Santa Claus out there, and kids are loving the experience, but deaf children don't have that. 
So to be able to connect is really important and amazing. To see him laugh and make those expressions with Santa Claus was the best, right? <laughs> the Christmas spirit alive in every language. Gary Grumbach, NBC News, National Harbor, Maryland. What an incredible story. Thanks so much, Gary. That does it for me this week. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Thank you so much for joining me on Now Tonight. The news continues, so feel free to stick around. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.